Can everybody hear me? Hope we're okay. Yes, all right, good. So, uh, thanks for having me back again. And I, I think I, if I didn't say it before, thanks to Z and Jerry and everybody, Derek and all you guys, uh, it's really, uh, wish we could be all together, but hopefully soon. So anyway, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, muscle group lengthening and in general a little bit, but I wanna tell you guys a, a little bit about why I love the modified Bauman gastroc recession. And uh, that's the Henry above, that's the coronavirus below, uh, and that is the calf to the right, if you didn't know. So let's consider a question first, shall we? Is Aquinas even an issue? Do, do we need to talk about this? Well, sure it is. Sure it is. It's, it's well documented. Here's a landmark paper from Di Giovanni. I got to be around this guy a little bit. He doesn't like podiatry very much. Uh, you should know that, but he's pretty talented. He was uh, uh, ended up uh, in Rhode Island at Brown, but when he was with Sig Hansen and San Georgian out in Seattle at Harborview, they did this paper and it's really a fantastic paper. It's pretty basic. They looked at people with pain and without pain and they found kind of that people that had forefoot and midfoot symptoms had less ankle dorsiflexion, but nobody had done it before. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it, it seems kind of how they get a paper out of that, but but this was it. You know, they kind of proved it. Um, all patients in their pain group had less ankle dorsiflexion than the control group. So we know that this is a little bit of a problem. Here's another one. This is actually out of Kalamazoo, out of Borges. Uh, this uh, Dr. Jastifer, I, I'm not familiar with these, um, with these docs, but uh, some local uh, talent over here, they did a really nice study. They looked at patients with and without foot pathology, once again, and they looked at who's got a, um, who's got a, uh, you know, a tight calf, and they they did, you know, they measured stuff with a goniometer, and they had a foot and ankle pain group, and they had a control group, and once again, they did some measurements, and they found 11.6 degrees of dorsiflexion in the pain group with the knee extended, and 17.2 degrees in the asymptomatic control group. Okay, no patients with 15 degrees. Uh, less than 15 degrees, excuse me, um, with knee, uh, uh, I'm sorry, no patients had less than 15 degrees uh, flexion with the knee flex. So in other words, these were all isolated uh, gastroc equinuses. As soon as you bent the knee and you took a gastroc out of it, they were quote unquote normal. This is an older paper from 1995. This uh, Dr. Hill in our uh, JAPMA journal looked and, and, and a lot of feet, 167 out of 209. And basically he said that 96.5% of people that had symptoms that they looked at had restricted ankle uh, dorsiflexion during gait, which was requiring compensation. Now, one of the things that he said, uh, not this, significant relation between compensation for ankle equinus and podiatric pathology. The other two papers said the same thing. But he said gastrocelial stretching is an important treatment modality. I put a question mark there. I'm not sure. We're going to talk about that in a second. But okay, so let's consider another question. Do we even need to fix equinus deformity with surgery, right? Okay, now we know it's a problem. Can't we stretch? I mean, we can, right? And of course we can. It's documented. Here's a paper. Does stretching increase ankle dorsiflexion range of motion? And they looked at a bunch of papers. This was a systematic review. And this is interesting finding. So if you stretch up to 15 minutes a day, you get 2.07 degrees of uh, added dorsiflexion. If you stretch for 15 to 30 minutes, you get 3.03 degrees. And if you stretch for 30 minutes or more, you get 2.49 degrees. I don't know why it goes down. That's what they found. I stretch daily and I do stretch for only 29 minutes because I do not want to lose any ankle dorsiflexion by stretching for 30 or more. This is, uh, there's my tattoo. You should know better, I don't have a tattoo. Uh, this is an old picture. I have a little bit of a sexier leg than that now, but this is, I literally show this to my patients in the room. This is the stretch I love. I keep my knee locked. I go inside the door. I tell them to grab the door jam and I put my foot up and I pull my whole body, and I really feel it in the back. But look at my dorsiflexion. I stretch a lot because I show patients every day practically, um, but I have about 45 degrees. 
so here's the thing how much how much is too much what do we need uh can we there's some science out there you know there's not a lot but here's a paper this was an interesting read what's normal and these guys were looking for a, a decision pathway to decide on whether impaired ankle dorsiflexion and gastroc tightness warranted needing to do something. And they had a wonderful hypothesis because this is really the case. We're missing a standardized examination procedure and we're missing normative values. And they had 64 asymptomatic subjects and dorsiflexion with the knee extended non-weight bearing was 22 degrees. Now that's a lot more than we tell our patients, plus or minus five, nine. They had a 95% com uh, confidence interval with the knee extended and uh, weight bearing. Now you're putting additional, uh, you know, stress on that. They're up to 33 degrees. And they got another 10 degrees as soon as you knock out gastroc and you're uh, stretching both. So uh, one more quick paper. This was a, uh, a paper out of the UK and it said this kind of was a, a dealing with that lack of normative values. It said ankle joint dorsiflexion, the title assessment of the true values. And what they did was this is uh, the little uh, table from this just one page paper, but they found that maximum dorsiflexion can mean anywhere from 12.43 degrees to 22.53 uh, degrees. So this five to 10 mantra that we've been pushing, I mean, is it BS? It kind of seems like it. We might need to lengthen a lot more of our patients. And believe me, I love doing lengthenings. I don't do a whole lot of TALs unless I'm going to be doing some kind of work where my patient's going to be immobilized for a little while because, you know, with a TAL, perk TALs are so easy to pop. They work really wonderfully. I had a triple uh, maybe six months ago and, you know, the, the TAL is done in about 20 seconds, literally. Uh, and then you get to work on the rest of the stuff and you know they're going to be immobilized. So the TAL doesn't matter at that point. But I love gastrox. There's a lot of them out there. I'm not here to pick on one over the other. Um, and I will tell you that uh, almost all of my uh, first MPJ fusions, which you know that I love, um, get gastrox if, if they uh, warrant them. Because... I used to see a lot more post-fusion sesamoiditis before I used to plane the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal or trephine ream and before I did gastrox. And that has really loosened up my forefoot, taken a little bit of that uh, bone out of there and, and, and done better. This guy, Chris Santino, he does not want, don't ever get this procedure. He clipped now. He's a regenerative medicine specialist. He's going to inject your Achilles with some synovial fluid and you will not need a gastroc uh, recession. But we know that's not true because look at all these procedures that people are doing. This is a meta-analysis. Uh, they're looking at multiple uh, diagnoses, insertional Achilles tendinopathy, non-insertional plantar fasciitis, metatarsalgia, a litany of different procedures. And look, they get, everybody gets better. Ankle range of motion goes up. People are improving. Their scores are getting better. So this guy doesn't like subtalar fusions either. If that tells you anything, he can fix your uh, subtalar joint arthritis with some of his jujubes, uh, whatever he's shooting in there. So listen, how, how can we lengthen this posterior group? Well, we've got open TALs, we've got perk TALs, we've got open gastrox, and we've got endoscopic gastrox, okay? Uh, open TALs, uh, Dr. Fallett used to do a lot of these. I, I loved these procedures. You, you really need to suture them in place. These are for pediatric flat foot. That tendon is so tiny. I don't really do a lot of these anymore, but you really want to see it. You want to cut a Z in it. You want to get it to where you need it to go. Hold that foot in proper position. Suture it under slight uh, tension. Of course, I mentioned with the PERC TAL, if you've got some bone procedures that are going to keep you off your foot, it's a really nice way to pop it. And of course, you can just lift that foot up, leave them supine if your procedures are supine and get that over with. Gastrox just do a little better because they, they're able, you're able to walk them a little easier. You know, they're, they're more favorable. Uh, there's less of a chance of over lengthening in calcaneus gait and not necessarily quicker. I've seen some EGRs take uh, a half hour because somebody gets lost in a big leg with a lot of adipose tissue. Uh, and I, I've had a few myself uh, where I, I almost converted it and we finally got in there. And on one of those patients, I gave him a real knocker of a, a neuritis because I was 
just trying to fart around with the tissue so long, you know, you think you're, you, you, this EGR is going to lend uh, some ease to this. And a lot of times it's, it's not the case. And uh, if your camera's not right and you got a lot of fluid in there, you can be underwater and um, you know, it's just not a, not easy. So, you know, there's all these different levels and I, I want to talk specifically about this Bauman and we're going to look at this because it's an intramuscular uh, lengthening. Uh, it's completely different from the aponeurotic lengthening of the strayer. Look where the strayer is. And essentially, as you guys know, an EGR is an endoscopic strayer. We're right at that level, somewhere in there. Uh, it's not a vulpius. We're not cutting a V. We're going straight across. The Hulk, of course, is the classic TAL. The Bauman is there on the uh, in, right in the muscle. And then Baruch, uh, who's a genius, uh, uh, did the medial uh, gastroc recession right below the crease of the knee. Um, and uh, regarding Dr. Baruch, this this uh, book has changed my life. If you don't have it, it's a few hundred dollars. It really has changed the way that I think about foot surgery. He was a visionary before his time, but this is just a, a, a few uh, quotes from, from him. He dedicates a whole chapter to his release below the knee. I've never done that. I, I, I figured always that that was a little over our scope. I didn't want to get somebody looking at me by going below the knee, but that procedure is a fairly easy thing to do. Um, and these were his quotes, the gastroc proximal release, that's his, the, the GPR, because he's right there under the knee, has a special place in our foot surgery. And regarding the forefoot, the excess of load pressure decreases significantly so that mild or moderate metatarsalgia may be re relieved by the GPR. In every case, the forefoot local surgery results are improved and secured, notably for hallux valgus or claw toe correction and for relieving metatarsalgia. And I just think that's such a telling quote. And of course, we can get that. We don't have to go to the GPR. We can get our gastroc from, from anywhere. Now, here's the thing. A lot of us like an EGR, it's small, uh, scar. It's fairly easy. Patients are supine, um, but it doesn't mean that it's without its complications. And I, I bring this slide up because look where the sural nerve is and look where your portals are. You're right in the middle. And if you didn't know, if you haven't read the literature, and I would assume that you have, if you do these, you know that sural neuritis has a special place in the heart of the EGR. Uh, these patients sometimes get uh, if it's not completely dinged or cut, uh, it's a neuritis that can take a little while to get rid of. Uh, Shannon Rush reported a case of CRPS uh, with a gastroc recession. So it's not benign. I don't want anybody to make small incisions uh, just like Elaine did such a great job. These these procedures are not without their complications. Just because you're going inside somewhere with small holes doesn't mean you can't do some damage. And it shouldn't make us flippant about uh, about what we're doing. But here's why I love the Bauman. Herzenberg out of uh, Baltimore looked at this. John has worked with uh, Mark Meyerson and Brad Lamb, our own Brad, who's a really bright guy. He was involved in this paper. Uh, once again, this is one man's opinion, but uh, this is why I, I, I love the Bauman. We're going to talk about this for a sec. Um, and I, I did bring that uh, article up for a second just to say that if you've if you really want to learn about this Bauman procedure, this is the paper to, to do it. And there's also a couple videos that you can watch, and I'm, I'm going to uh, relate them too. But anyway, here's, uh, here's a quick note about a previous uh, paper in Podiatry Today by Dr. Buffelli and Samantha Luer, who was uh, clearly she wrote this. She was one of Dr. Buffelli's residents at the time. I think they're in Minnesota. And you know what they said? They said it was a, a, a less aggressive procedure as opposed to some of the other lengthenings, right? And, and right where they say this in their article, right here on that bottom paragraph, the proximal location of this procedure makes it a true gastroc only, which is less aggressive. And they uh, quoted two um, studies. Now, number four is in German, and I, I can't read that. That's actually Baumann's. But Kai Rung, uh, was number five. And so a while ago, when I looked at starting this procedure, I pulled this paper like any of us should do. And here's Rong's paper right here. And what he found was that the mean increase in dorsiflexion was 13.6 degrees. Now, I honestly don't consider that too shabby. He had no case of uh, overcorrection. He had no neurovascular issue and he had no healing problems. And I 
personally, I don't know if Dr. Buffelli or Dr. Luer, who probably wrote it, uh, read the paper all that well. Um, just my opinion. Here's, uh, uh, you know, Amos Saxena is a guy in our literature, real bright guy. He's looking at the EGR. So here's his results. And, and he's a really bright surgeon, technically uh, talented guy. At 12 months, 12.6 degrees. Well, didn't the Bauman just get 13.6? This is a more distal procedure. How is it not as powerful, Dr. Buffelli? I, I don't see that. Uh, there was there was that Bauman compared to this endoscopic strayer. Here's another thing. 15% of people experienced uh, lateral uh, dysthesias. They, they, they whacked that uh, sural nerve a little bit. Uh, there were none in the Bauman paper. So I'm already seeing pluses for the Bauman. Here's a Vulpius uh, procedure for patients with hemiplegia. And uh, once again, just to remind you, that's really in the heart of the uh, muscle belly right there. That's heart. If you don't uh, know, just a little brevity right there for you. Let's get rid of heart right there. Um, here's that paper back again, a post-operative net improvement of 10 degrees, a more distal procedure than the Bauman, less noted, uh, dorsiflexion than the Bauman. Now, once again, we're throwing a little wrench into this. These people have hemiplegia, but once again, you'd think that you'd get somewhere close, 10 degrees, 13.6 degrees. There's their data. I'd say the Bauman so far is just hanging in there. Here's that, um, paper by Barsky looking at all those papers. And uh, here's what they did. Strayer was 13. Uh, th this paper here by Labor didn't report. There's another Strayer by 14. Here's a EGR paper that didn't report. And there's a Strayer with 18.1. So looking at the Bauman and looking at these, once again, I, I don't know if I'd call that. Here's that paper again from Buffelli. And there's the docs. And I would just say, hey, maybe maybe uh, change your mind, uh, you know, read the papers that you've cited uh, before you make a statement like that. I, I just don't agree with them. Um, this is Kai Rong again. You have to read this if you get a chance, if you're going to do these procedures. This was fantastic. What they did was they took some cadavers and they looked at several different procedures and amazing. They took these uh, spacer plates and they put them in the muscle after they did the different procedures. And then using those spacer plates, you can get a significant amount of data on how much distance you're getting and how much flexion you're getting. And, and they looked at each of these. And what they found was that when you look at some of these uh, different procedures, the Baruch, which is the very proximal gastroc recession, uh, I'll, I'll put this out instead of making you do the tally on the um, table there, but Baruch got 14.8 degrees and 22 millimeters of distance. Now, if you do a Bauman and you do one cut, and we're going to talk about this really briefly in a second, you get 11.6 degrees. However, if you add a second Bauman, which is simple, 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 you get an additional 7.8 degrees and another 10 millimeters of motion. The Bauman total is 19.4 degrees. And once again, I would say to Dr. Buffelli and Dr. Luer, take a look at that because uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, Strayer's getting 22 degrees. And, and as it should, it is a more distal resection, but I, I think they discounted the power of the Bauman. And to me, uh, a little bit less problems uh, when you're going a little higher. Uh, here is Herzenberg. There's that paper. Once again, look at when you do one recession of the Bauman versus two. Look at the additional dorsiflexion. If you go to the other side and you add a soleus recession, it's really not worth it. You get about another degree. Uh, and so there's really no point in doing that. And look, it's not that far off if you cut the Achilles in half, which uh, you do for some clubfoot kids. Uh, you really can get a uh, beautiful motion from, from this procedure. Uh, once again, why I love it, there's less problems with the sural nerve. The EGR has rates anywhere from zero to 11 degrees. And that's the, uh, uh, that's the uh, data uh, retain, uh, pertaining, excuse me, to that uh, uh, percentage. And at the Bauman level, where you're doing this, the sural is deep between the heads of the gastroc muscle. And it's actually on the opposite side of the ap aponeurosis where you're working. It's not directly in the surgical field. That's why there's a lower chance to have a problem. Notice once again, the precarious position of that sural at the site where you're putting your portals. Once again, small holes, everybody loves it. You're supine uh, in both of these procedures. Uh, 
but I, I think there's benefits. I really do. I used to get a lot of transient uh, serial neuritis after my EGRs. And now I will tell you, I do nothing other than Bauman's. And if I'm doing something on the rare occasions that I'm in the rear of the calcaneus, I don't know if any of you guys, maybe it's just my hands. I have I have mixed uh, results after Achilles retrocalcaneal stuff. If you ask Dr. Alan Jacobs, who I have a lot of respect for, he says, don't touch that damn thing. Stay away from the back of the heel. And I'll tell you, I do a lot of isolated Bauman's on my... Uh, uh, people with a spur and they get better and you don't have to touch it back there. And then as soon as you start taking that stuff off and trying to reattach it with whatever dealer's choice on uh, whatever anchor, or whatever you want to use it, it just, some of my patients just don't do all that well. I don't know if you get really, if you slam dunk and have a thousand uh, percent, uh, give me a call. I, I want to know what you're doing. But uh, if I do do something on the back, if I have a, even an Achilles rupture, I start them supine. I, I can't do these Bauman's upside down. Maybe somebody could show me how to do that. But the way that I do them, uh, I do them with the patient supine. And then uh, they flip that patient and I go get a coffee. And I don't care if it takes a, a little time in the OR. I, I, I want the best result for the patient. And so I turn them over. Uh, and uh, that's what I do. So I'm always doing this. Um, there's also less push-off issues. There's always a trade-off with a gastroc recession, right? There's increased motion and decreased power whenever we do anything to the posterior muscle group. And uh, gastroc recessions have less strength issues versus TALs. This is a paper from uh, uh, Dr. Chimera. Uh, and what they showed was that in seven legs for different, four patients for different uh, releases, they did an IM release and they had no detrimental issues to plantar flexion strength after three months. And you could see weakness sometimes after, personally, even for me with a gastroc recession, I got some weakness after some EGRs. I don't see that after my Bauman's. Uh, here's uh, Shannon Rush, who I respect very well. Neil Blitz is the uh, Bunyan King of New York. You literally can Google that and you'll see him. He takes a plane between New York and LA and fixes uh, Starlet's Bunyans, I guess. He's probably rich. Uh, but they did a paper, uh, the gastroc intermuscular aponeurotic recession, and they looked at what the difference is. And I think they explained it really well. The strayer or the EGR, the higher gastroc recession, uh, it, it, you're literally detaching completely from soleus. And that puts people at a little higher risk for a push-off issue. And the Bauman essentially preserves some of that insertion because of where you're doing it. You're doing it inside the muscle. You're not going below the heads of the gastroc, which is where you're doing it for a strayer and an EGR. And uh, this maintains a little bit of a weakened effect on the foot. And you can assume uh, a little bit of a likelihood of less calf atrophy. What do I do for anesthesia? This is the Bauman alone. Or I typically, I do a lot of these with instep fasciotomies. If you guys remember my lecture from last year, uh, when you have a, when I have a measurement of a six millimeter or greater uh, fascia, I include an instep fasciotomy and I walk these patients now. I put them under general because with the Bauman, of course, you need muscle relaxation. I love my uh, guys at my surgery centers, excuse me, give me a single shot. Uh, pop lock, and these do well. And of course, any ancillary procedures like an adult acquired flat foot, uh, I'll do an indwelling catheter, but it's dealer's choice on, on what you're doing. They'll do an LMA on these patients in the OR that get a, uh, uh, that get a uh, single pop lock. Here's the incision. Now, I have to give some credit in my few minutes left. I'm going to show the procedure to Dr. Dehir. Of course, I had a bunch of these canceled due to COVID and I wanted to get some pictures for this lecture. And literally now, I think I have four or five of these coming up in the next uh, few weeks, uh, which is, does not help me now. But this is where the incision is. And I do wanna show you, uh, it's about four centimeters long. I measure these with the ruler. I measure four centimeters and I measure two millimeters away from the very medial aspect of the tibial crest because your, uh, your uh, saphenous nerve and vein, I don't typically see them, but they're right there. You have to be cognizant of them. This is just above the myotendinous junction, and these close-ups are, are due to him. And he's the guy that I called when I wanted to start doing these, and he was so gracious to me. I spoke to him via email, and he gave me some tips before I started these a while ago, and this is now my go-to. This is one of my patients, though. She had an instep fasciotomy. She had a kidner. But look, there's the incision. Look how small it is to do this Bauman, and that's right where it is.
right in the belly of that muscle. There she is a little closer and there she is right there. Uh, she was one week post-op and, and it's a tiny little incision if you look. Um, it's really nothing. Okay, this is back to Dr. Dehir because I wanted to show you these, but the saphenous nerve is right above these. You're gonna head in with a METS and you're going to get that fat out of the way. I love Chung retractors because Chung's have a deeper blade than Sen's do. And, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a weedy. And so when you put that Chung in there, they've got deeper, they've got deeper tips, a heavier patient. You can, I move my finger around to get that fat out of the way. I do this exactly the same way. This is my way to do it. And I promise next year when we come back, I'll have a video for you close up uh, so you can see it uh, uh, close. But you can, you can, Dr. Dehir actually has some videos online on YouTube. If you think about doing this, they're so cool. It just gives you all the, uh, you know, all the tools to, to be able to do these. But finger dissection, here comes Chung, Wang Chung. You get that guy in there, you're going to incise your deep fascia. I make a little rent with a 15 blade. I cut this with a blade. You want to dorsiflex your foot when you're doing this. It puts that muscle a little deeper. And so you can uh, not tag so much muscle belly when you're uh, cutting and getting through your fascia. Your finger to sit. Now, this is the this is the part of the procedure. You can get your finger too far posterior and you can fall into the plane where an EGR is. And when you open this up with your retractor, you'll know behind you in the posterior segment is a bunch of sub Q. And if you stick your knife in there, you're going to be in deep shit. Pardon my French, because you're going to whack the sural nerve and that's the way things are going to go bad. You want to be in between the muscle belly and you fall into this beautiful little plane. And when you separate it and you put in your uh, your rectal speculum that we use to separate these. It's just a real pretty little picture in there. And you'll know if you're in the wrong layer. If you see that sub Q posteriorly, you better get your finger back in there and get more anterior to find your plane. So once again, you can get to posterior. That's a big no-no. Uh, I already said this. You don't want to muscle it. The, the level that you go into that's the right level just falls in you will make a false interval and you can get your finger in there. You're gonna see the beautiful layer. Here's that chung coming out. Here's our rectal retractor, uh, retractor coming in. The soleus pops out a little bit when you're just leaving things alone. So you take your chung retractor out and you put your speculum in. Now, the choice of speculum is uh, really good. I know some of my, I know, um, some of my colleagues here that do uh, intramuscular stuff in the leg. That's the vag spec on the left. Look at how much instrumentation is off of the foot. You narrow your surgical window so much. This Sims retractor is what uh, some people use. I'm going to show you what I use, but look inside that uh, that uh, window on the right. That's the uh, gastroc aponeurosis posteriorly. You're in the right layer. This is the uh, tool that I had my um, uh, surgery center buy for me. I found this and this is called the Schulze Bergman anal retractor. I make sure that the colorectal guys have washed it before I do my surgery. Just uh, sterility purposes there. There's the vag spec coming way off the surface of the skin, narrowing your window. It's so nice. Look at how everything's out of the way. That's the, that's the aponeurosis. That's your gastroc. Your soleus is above. When you first go in there, you're going to look for your plantaris. It may be on the side of the soleus. If you want to cut it, it adds a couple degrees. If it's on the gastroc side, you're going to get it when you run your blade through and you do your gastroc aponeurosis. I get my finger in there. There's me again talking ahead of myself, finding the plantaris. You need a long 15 for this, especially if you have a vag spec because it's really, really deep in there. But I love this instrument. It goes flush to the skin. Use a 15. I prefer that over an 11 because you're really going to use the very belly of the blade. And when your resident or whoever your scrub is leaning on that foot, and right now the foot is on a sterile mayo stand, it's sitting up there. You're dorsiflexing. All you do is drag this blade over, and it's crazy how it just opens itself up. Cut lightly from lateral to medial. Don't whack that muscle belly. Someone should be dorsiflexing the foot and you'll see that their belly or their hand is going to move. And this is the video that I wanted to catch for you guys side by side. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the best laid plans. Uh, but I'll, I'll get one uh, I'll get one later. The to hear videos do not have that. And I think it would be a real benefit. But um, uh, cut the proximal aspect first. Here's that... Uh, Here's that one cut, two cut Bauman. You're going to cut just adjacent to the proximal leg of your speculum. And then if you need that second Bauman cut, I literally finish the one. I take the uh, 
the speculum out and I dorsiflex. If I don't have enough, the spec goes back in, the Schulze Bergman goes back in and I make my second cut next to the distal. There's the first cut. You can see it just dragged across once again. I wish I had a video for you, but we'll get it to you soon. Uh, there's that second cut at the other end and that adds that other seven degrees of motion. It's really beautiful. Uh, I flush and I literally inject the muscle with some epinephrine. It makes the incision a little white, but it cuts down on wound complications. And as long as you're not retracting this too much, Dr. Dehir actually uses a uh, synovial skin graft here. I think it just adds too much expense to the case, especially if I'm down there and I'm spending three, four, five grand on hardware for a first MPJ. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do is throw that on my surgery center. And they do fine uh, without it. I think if you're good with your tissue and the epi really helps when you're closing your fascia, it's at least 3-0, dealer's choice. You want to make sure you dorsiflex that foot again because that soleus and everything else dive really deep and you just get them out of the way of your closure. Here's my post-op course, immediately weight-bearing in a cam boot, even with the instep fasciotomy, cam weight-bearing for two weeks. You got to sleep in that boot though for four weeks and here's why. Here's a bunch of studies showing potential equinus recurrence rates and it doesn't go all the way back, but if you look, there's some pretty substantial rates with TAL and with GR, you don't want to let your gastroc, uh, you know, uh, get back to being tighter again. So keep them in that boot or, uh, you know, you can use a night splint, but I like a boot. It just holds them a little better. Can you over lengthen these? Well, when you look on PubMed and you search gastroc recession, there's 1,755 results. And when you add over lengthening, there's only seven. And when you look at them, there's a couple descriptive papers. One EGR had an over lengthening. A strayer with 126 patients had no over lengthenings and serial neuritis, of course, we talked about that in four patients. Here's um, uh, Bauman, they did get a couple um, over lengthenings in this one paper uh, in JBJS, uh, but it was only 9%. Uh, you know, it, it can easily come back because with therapy of where you're doing the lengthening. Uh, and a couple of the other ones, that was a spastic diplegia vulpius, uh, that we referred to earlier, uh, they really didn't get much uh, uh, over lengthening. One of my favorite poems, uh, and uh, I appreciate you. Here's the video uh, when you YouTube Bauman Gastroc Recession. Um, there's the two videos. I think I put that in too early. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dehir can show you right away how to how to do that. Uh, just watch him on that video. I want to bring up my bacon poem again. Thanks a lot. It's